welcome to The Real Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. Of all the people we've met over the years on Real Sports, perhaps none are more inspiring and beloved than Dick and Rick Hoyt. The Hoyts have been featured on Real Sports four different times because their father-son story never gets old. For those who don't know, Dick Hoyt became an icon in the running and triathlon community, first in his hometown of Boston, and then across the country, not just because of his own athletic prowess, and he was a heck of an athlete, but because he showed up to hundreds of marathons and triathlons with a partner, his son Rick. Strangled during birth by his own umbilical cord, Rick was born with cerebral palsy and without the ability to move or to speak. But Dick was determined to raise his son like any other Boston boy, immersed in sports. And as he grew up, the only thing Rick seemed to love more than his Boston Bruins was taking to the road with his dad, where Dick would pull, pedal, and push Rick every step of the way. They became regulars at every race New England had to offer, and over time, their story of inspiration grew and grew. Sadly, Dick Hoy passed away last month, on March 17th, at the age of 80. So to pay homage, we wanted to use this edition of the podcast to trace the history of the Hoyts as told on Real Sports. And to help us do so, we're joined by Dave McGillivray. Dave himself was an expert distance runner, and he's the longtime director of the Boston Marathon. Dave's known Dick and Rick for 40 years as their friend, fellow competitor, and eventually he became their manager, giving him a front row seat to watch the Hoyts' remarkable ride. Dave, thanks so much for being with us. Max, thanks so much for allowing me to join you on this very special podcast about two dear friends. So our audience is about to hear a number of clips about those friends of yours, the Hoyts, and everything they've done over the years. But before we get to that, since Dick's passing, Dave, what's the response been like? It's been everything you would expect, Max. That news traveled so fast and so far, and literally tens of thousands have responded either with emails or social media posts or texts or phone calls. And I think that just shows the impact that both Rick and Dick have had, you know, on society about, yes, you can, you can do anything you set your mind to, as long as you're willing to accept the sacrifices involved. And the fact that Dick basically gave up his life for his son in so many ways and participated in endurance sports for a greater purpose than just himself resonated throughout the region, throughout the country, throughout the world. Well, on Real Sports, Mary Carrillo first sat down with the Hoyts in 2005. At the time, few around the country knew their amazing story, even though they'd already been competing nearly every weekend for over 25 years and taking the New England racing community, including Dave here, by storm. Here's a clip from the Hoyts' first appearance on Real Sports 16 years ago. Dick and Rick Hoyt have completed over 200 triathlons and on their lazier Sunday afternoons, over 60 marathons. The fastest in a time just half hour off the world record. Yes, the real world record. They say Dick Hoyt could have been an elite endurance athlete on his own. Dick's not so sure. A lot of people say, well, you know, you'd be able to win the marathon, you'd be able to do this, you'd be able to do that. And, and I just don't have the desire to be out there running by myself. I think it's just something that comes from his body to my body, and it makes us go faster. Are you trying to say that you run faster pushing Rick than if you didn't run with him? Oh, yeah. He, he inspires me and he motivates me. And he's actually the athlete, and he's very competitive. He wants to win. First time you saw the Hoyts, what do you remember seeing? I remember seeing um, Dick's back. Dave McGilvery was an expert distance runner who'd go on to become head of the Boston Marathon. I was actually floored by the fact that here's an individual pushing someone in a wheelchair passing me. And at the time, I thought I was a fairly competitive road racer. And I had to find him at the finish line and talk to him and find out what, what this was all about. Impressed, McGilvery challenged Dick Hoyt to upgrade from road races to full marathons. No problem. 
So McGilvery raised the bar again. Maybe it was just my competitiveness, but just out of nowhere, I blurted out, have you ever tried a triathlon? Well, I looked at Dave and I said, Dave, only if I can do it with Rick. I was like, uh, hello? With, how are you gonna do that? Simple, really. Dick moved to the country, where he trained himself to bike and swim with Rick. It was his first time on any bike since age six. And that was the easy part. You really didn't know how to swim at all? No, I, I ain't kidding you. When I jumped in that lake, I couldn't go 10 feet. <laughs> My, I sank. I couldn't tread water or anything else. That was 1985. This was 1989, Hawaii, site of the most grueling endurance race in the world, the Ironman Triathlon, a 2.2-mile ocean swim, followed by 112 miles on a bike, then, for good measure, a full marathon, all under the island sun. The world's best were there, including the guy who put the Hoyts up to this ultimate challenge. We were competing against one another once again, and I could see them coming from a distance. And as they're getting closer and closer, I can tell how Dick was struggling. But then I looked down at Rick, and an incredible feeling overcame me of what Rick is going through. Yeah, Dick is pulling and pushing and tugging and grunting, but Rick is there as that inspirational source. Plus, he's dealing with all the elements, too. He's dealing with the heat. He's dealing with the wind. And it takes a lot of strength to say, Dad, um, I, I want to continue. I want to participate. I want to compete in the next race with you. And even though they work off each other, they're both competing sort of autonomously, too, as individual athletes. And it took a little while before that realization hit me. And then I, I realized how much of an incredible athlete Rick is, not just his dad, but Rick truly is. I'm back with Dave McGillivray. Dave, when you first hear about the Hoyts, you might think it's a dad deciding to do these things and bringing along his son, but entering these races was really often Rick's idea, right? Yeah, for me personally, the story goes back when I was doing a, producing a lot of triathlons at the time. And I remember Dick calls me up and he said, Rick has a question for you. I said, oh, okay, what's that? Um, can you get us in the Ironman triathlon in Hawaii? I'm like, wait a minute, excuse me. That's like going from the little league to the major leagues, like in one leap. I said, yeah, don't you think you should kind of you know, chip off a few more triathlons before you jump into the big leagues. And he said, well, Rick wants to do it. And I said, well, okay, what about you? He said, Rick wants to do it. I said, I know Rick wants to do it. What about you? Rick wants to do it. And it just, that it said everything to me. It said, if Rick wants to do it, we're doing it. And, but he knew in his mind that he really needed to step it up. And he really now needed to change his own lifestyle in terms of becoming um, you know, a multifaceted athlete, not just a runner, that he would have to learn how to swim and, and learn how to bike with Rick you know, on the bike. Um, those were daunting you know, goals that he set for himself. And again, he went out and did it. Yeah, this isn't taking your kid to the beach or the ball game because they want to do it. This is the this is the Ironman. Exactly. And so he trained real hard and he did a few more triathlons. And so we all went to Hawaii together that year. And I so remember being on the on the beach going right before going in the water, giving him a hug, wishing him well. So I did the swim. I get out of the water. I was on the bike. You go out to this point halfway called Javi. You turn around and you come back. As we're coming back, I'm looking for the Hoyts. Where are the Hoyts? And I'm seeing cyclists coming towards me as I'm heading back to transition two. No Hoyts. Where are the Hoyts? And then the trail vehicle comes, the final cyclist comes, no Hoyts. I said, what happened to the Hoyts? And I later found out um, they didn't make the cutoff time for the swim. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I thought, that's it. Their triathlon career is over. But even though they didn't make the cutoff for the swim, about a month or two later, I get another call from Dick and he said, hey, Rick has another question to ask you. I said, what's that? He wants you to get us back into the Ironman again. Well, we got him in. And 
they were able to complete it this time. And again, ended up doing triathlons all over the country, all over the world, got inducted into the Ironman Triathlon Hall of Fame. So from, from the little league to the major leagues to the Hall of Fame. So give me the rundown, uh, the statistical rundown, Dave. By the time Dick and Rick were done competing as a pair, do you know how many marathons and triathlons they racked up in total? Well, I know that the Hoyts competed in over 1,100 total races, 5Ks, 10Ks, halves, marathons, triathlons, everything from sprints to long course distance to ultra distance, doing Ironman 6 Ironman distance triathlons. I think it was 32 Boston marathons, uh, well over uh, like 60 some odd marathons in total. I mean, and that's Dick Push and Rick. I mean, if you look at those numbers just being completed by somebody who's just an endurance athlete, it would be stunning. And then you look at the fact that, you know, they did it this way as a pair as a duo and just just think about the preparation for that i mean anytime dick and rick needed to fly to go to an event it was an ordeal and a half you know to sort of pack all that gear up and uh, the special bike and the special wheelchair and all the gear and and you know taking care of rick and carrying him from point to point to point and I mean, just the logistics of it all, let alone the participating in the competition itself. Um, I still shake my head, even though I was like right there next to them most of the time. I'm like, I don't know how you're doing this, but he did it. So um, pretty, pretty amazing numbers. Over time, the Hoyts became Boston legends. Uh, they were inducted into various Hall of Fames. But they did more than earn personal accolades. They also sparked inspiration across the country, as we learned when we revisited them in 2007 and again in 2010. Take a listen. These days, Dick and Rick have even more competition on the course. In the past two years, they've heard from hundreds of families who started racing and been inspired by them. That really makes us feel, feel good. That probably is the reason why we continue doing it because we're helping so many people. Like Mike Mather in Norfolk, Virginia. As soon as his four-year-old son Owen was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, Mather educated himself by following all things Hoyt, including our first story. Here I am feeling sorry for myself, and here's this man up in New England putting his son you know, in a raft and towing him you know, across the water putting him on the front of a bicycle and pedaling you know, more than 100 miles and then racing a marathon. And if he can do that, I can pick myself up and um, make sure that my son knows that I will put out that effort for him too. Good job, partner, good job. And so another team was formed. Are you ready to run? Huh? Last September, Mike and Owen competed in their first race, a half marathon in Virginia Beach, alongside Dick and Rick. It was also the first meeting for the two father-son teams. Before I ever met them, and before I ever ran a single mile to race with them, I already owed them so much. It was just an amazing feeling to meet these folks. And uh, I mean, there are not a lot of people I consider heroes, but good Lord, they qualify. The Hoyts are inspiring families without disabled members too. In 12 cities across the country, volunteer groups have formed to help disabled athletes who don't have a family member to compete with them. At races in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, volunteer pushers are paired with athletes of all ages, and they finish as a team. These are volunteers who want to push disabled kids. That's what's amazing to me. They're not their mother and father or somebody in the family. It's just volunteers who are out there, and they want to do this. Over the years, people all over the world have reached out to the Hoyts. Every day, they receive more than 200 emails and letters thanking them for their inspiration. This is an email you got um, a couple of years ago. Dear Mr. Hoyt and Ricky, I lost my beloved husband of 25 years four months ago. It has been a pain that I cannot describe. Then I saw your video. The day I watched it, I had decided to just end it. And I had everything planned to the last detail. 
I'm here because of that video. I just wanted you to know that you and Ricky are two of my heroes. Thank you again. The subject heading is, you saved my life. You saved a life. Yeah. So for those who haven't seen this story, that noise you just heard at the end was Rick. That sound is, is the closest he can really come to speaking. He can, however, communicate through the use of a computer by using his eyes and his head, which you'll hear a little later. But Dave, going back to that clip we just listened to, that was over 10 years ago. In the time since, how wide has this trend of Hoyt inspiration grown? What's really interesting is back in the late 70s when they started out in the 80s, I think people were in awe and they were like, this this is a world-class athlete. This is special. This is way beyond my capabilities to be able to do something like that. And I, I think for a while, people watched, were inspired, but backed off. And then I'm not sure what made that spark happen, but all of a sudden, it just took off. And I think it was because of the Hoyts actually trying to encourage others to do it and them starting Team Hoyt and starting their own chapters. And I so remember I went to the Louisiana Marathon to run in the marathon and I went to the expo and there was a booth and it was called Ansley's Angels. And I thought, what is this? And I went up and I introduced myself and they said, oh yeah, you know, this is who we are. And it was exactly the same as the Hoyts. Ansley's angels, the angels were the kids in the chair and people pushing those kids with disability. I said, how did, how did you come up with this idea of doing this? They go, oh, the Hoyts. I said, okay, that seems to make sense. Then I put on a race in Green Bay, Wisconsin called the Bell and Run. And all of a sudden, like 10 duos show up. And I said, oh, where did you get your beginnings? Oh, the Hoyts. I'm like, wow. And, you know, it's interesting. I think that they have inspired folks to do it similar to the method that they do, but they've inspired other athletes with disability, para-athletes, to participate either in a wheelchair or a hand cycle or with a prosthetic. Um, it, it, you know, so it's not just duos. They've inspired so many others who otherwise maybe never would have given this a chance. What was it like for you as organizer of the Boston Marathon to see this trend explode, to see at the starting line of the Boston Marathon year over year, more and more people show up, you know, emulating or following in the footsteps of, of the Hoyts example? You know, that's an interesting question because... When you look at something like Boston or other iconic events, you know, the unfortunate downside, you know, you're, you're a victim sometimes of your own success in terms of, um, you know, an event and being able to only accept so many participants. So once you reach a fill size limit, you have to sort of tell people, sorry, we're, we're full. And so you're turning people away. Well, we never had to do that um, for a duo division or a wheelchair division or even a hand cycle program in the Boston Marathon. But because of folks like the Hoyts inspiring so many, so many want in now that it's, it's unbelievable the interest and the, and the stories, but there's only so many you can accommodate too. So that's sort of been the struggle for us. It's a good thing, bad thing. It's a good thing in that there's so much interest, but it's an unfortunate thing that you can't necessarily accommodate at all. Dick was clearly ultra competitive in his own right, but do you think this wave of influence and inspiration that they were having gave him a little bit of extra fire in his final years of competing? I think it totally did. He had, you know, heart, illness issues. He had, you know, 
he had back issues. I mean, there was there was a lot of physical ailments that he was dealing with in the in the last 10 years. But son of a gun, he he just somehow overcome them and get back out there on the road and keep pushing. And and um, it was one story was it was funny because, you know, I send them off at the start of the race and then I jump usually jump on a motor scooter and I ride, you know, in the front of the pack the whole way down course. And of course, every single year I pull up next to the Hoyts. There they are. The elites are about to pass them at mile eight or 10. And a couple of years ago, you know, and we would, we would, you know, sort of say hi and how you doing and all that. And one year I said, so how you feeling? He goes, oh, I'm really hurting. I said, why? He says, oh, I, I don't have socks on. And I forgot my socks and my feet are just burning up. And I said, well, I'll pull over get off the motor scooter and I'll give you my socks. He's like, no, that's an unfair advantage. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I said, Dick, it's not a big deal. Like no one's going to say anything. Just, you know, you don't want to burn up your feet. He, nope. And he just kept on going. You know, it just, the guy was a bull and then it's infectious. Then it comes back to you and you want to do more. So the more that they were seeing the results of what they were accomplishing, the more he wanted to accomplish, right? So it just, again, fed on itself. And, you know, I always wondered in a very respectful way, you know, you know, is Dick doing this for Rick or is Rick doing this for Dick? Are they doing it for each other? Do they both truly want to be doing this? Or does one want to do it and the other not so much? You know, I don't know. But just, just seeing the smile on Rick's face and knowing the joy that he was giving his son sort of solved that conundrum for me saying, no, they both want to be out there for as long as they can, inspiring as many people as they can. And eventually they did plan their farewell. As we learned when we met back up with the Hoyts in 2014, they had run the Boston Marathon the year before, expecting it to be their swan song, but then tragedy struck. We got to the 22 mile marker and I noticed a, a more police activity going on. So I stopped at, the, at, at a policeman and I says, is there something going on? Mm -hmm. And that's when he told me that two bombs had exploded at the finish line. What were you thinking? We were thinking that there's no way something like that can happen. Who would do something like that, you know? As far as I was concerned, when the bombs went off, the marathon was over. But it wasn't long before Dick and Rick resolved that they would return for this year's race to end their remarkable tale of determination on their own terms. So you're going to do it again? So we're going to do it again, yes. You have back problems. Right, yeah. You have carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. You've had all kinds of heart issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You may need some surgery after the marathon, right? Yes, yeah, it's a good possibility. So what are you hoping to do this year? Well. We're hoping to get across the finish line, and we will get across the finish line. And on the day of the marathon, Dick and Rick set out to make good on that promise. We were with them as Boston cheered them all along the way. And then, with a final time of seven hours, 16 minutes, a far cry from their glory days, they finally made it across the finish line. And the end of an era was reached. But while this is the end of Team Hoyt as we've come to know them, the running isn't done. While Dick is retiring from marathons, Rick is going to find someone else to push him and continue to compete. Back at the house, Rick couldn't resist taking a jab at his old running buddy. Is there anything you want to say to your dad? As the saying goes, when old horses turn up lame, put them out of their misery. <laughs> dad, I will keep galloping along. Oh, that's a great <laughs> answer. That's awesome. How do you feel about him being with a different partner? Oh, I think Is it's awesome. Is that hard to hand off? No, I think it's awesome. I really do. Why should he quit, you know? He's only 52. He's got all those years to catch up to me. I'm 73. Are you going to go to all those races? I hope to, yeah. Wow. You're always going to be at his side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave, I can only imagine how emotional that entire day was at the 2014 marathon 
a year out from the bombing. But what goes through your mind at the end of the day, seeing Dick and Rick cross that finish one last time? Well, obviously it was a a special year. Um, We all were determined to take back, you know, Boylston Street to take back our finish line. You know, the perpetrators mess with the wrong crowd. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I just knew that 2014 would be epic. Signs everywhere, just, you know, sh- cheering. We will, Boston strong. Um, we will not be denied our freedom. And then you see the Hoyts. And it was just the icing on the cake. It was just um, just to see them come across the finish line with all their team members running with them the last mile or a few hundred yards um, was just a, a fitting closure to a day that really emphasized that the, the perseverance of this running community and a big part of that was, was the Hoyts. We just heard in that last clip Rick cracking some jokes at his dad's expense using that computerized voice machine, which he operates with his eyes in his head. He also uses that machine to text. You told me you've been in touch with Rick over text. How's he doing? How's he he handling the news and, and holding up? You know, when I was communicating with him, he seemed to understand and accept. He knew that his dad had some health issues, um, as he has had over the last year or so. And that's why he's in a, a location now where he, he's being attended to 24-7 himself. But, you know, I, I, I think he's anxious to get back out on the road. So I think Rick will carry on that legacy. Um, Patriots Day is coming up, uh, which would have been marathon Monday. So I'm going to get up early that morning, run around, run a marathon around my neighborhood. Why? Because I don't know. I have nothing else to do. Plus, um, that's what I've done on Patriots Day for 48 years. So I might as well do that. And then I'm driving out to see Rick. And um, I'm going to be with him while his um, Dick's grandson pushes him a mile around the area where he is living right now. And honor and tribute to his dad. That's great. Um, You mentioned that Rick, even with his dad passing, he's chomping at the bit to to get back out on the road. Dave, you're actually one of only three people who has pushed Rick in a race. Tell me about that. What was that like? That particular, you know, instance when I pushed him, um, they came to my house on my 60th birthday. I usually run my age on my birthday every year and I was turning 60, so I was running 60 miles. So they came and ran some miles with me. And when we were done, they gave me a gift certificate for my birthday present. And it was an opportunity to push Rick in any race of my choice. So I pushed him in the finish at the 50 at Gillette Stadium um, in Foxborough, 10K. And when when I was at the race, even I was directing it too, but when I was at the race and we were ready to go, I was like, hey, you know, I've known Rick for 40 years, but I've never... I, I, I never remember ever being alone with him for an extended period of time. I'm going to be with him for an hour, just me and him. What do I say? What do I do? So the gun fires and we take off. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to bring Rick down memory lane. You know, we're just going to talk about all the great times we shared over the years from the first triathlon to the Ironman triathlon to him running in Fenway Park when I put on the Fenway Park Marathon to him just doing all these different events that we've shared time together. Well, we had a blast. We had a blast. And I'm telling him stories and he's laughing. (laughs) And, you know, we crossed the finish line. Both of us were exhausted, but we both had smiles on our face because it was just such a, a, a great experience spending alone time. Dave, Dick Hoyt has left a lasting mark on your hometown and on the sport you love. In your words, how would you sum up their legacy and the lessons you learned spending all those years with with Dick and Rick? Well, 
you know, you've seen the movie Chariots of Fire. And there are some real poignant moments in that movie. Well, I had a similar experience when I was directing a triathlon on Cape Cod and the weather was just nasty. And the chop in the ocean was just, it seemed like three feet high. Um, and Dick and Rick were going to do it. And I said, you sure you wanna go out in these conditions, Dick? He said, I'm okay with it. I said, what about Rick? You know, <laughs> he's okay with it. I said, all right, I'm gonna send you guys off first and then I'll send off the rest of the field, okay. So he takes off and you can see the wind is blowing against the, the boat and Dick is struggling and I'm going, oh, I feel so bad. I shouldn't have sent him in the water, but he kept going and going. Then I sent everyone else in the water and they're swimming and they're catching up to the hoids. But then all the swimmers are having trouble too. And then I looked away and then I looked back again. And in the distance, I can see Dick still swimming and Rick in the boat, but there's like 10 guys hanging on the boat. And, and I'm like, wait a minute here. You know, what are these guys doing? Dick is pulling like a dozen people through the water. And the guy was so bullheaded, he didn't even look back. He didn't wince once. He just kept on going and going and going. And it just, I said, oh my goodness, I can't believe what I'm witnessing right here. And it's the same thing with them doing Iron Man and the same thing with them, you know, pushing through really challenging conditions in Boston. And, you know, when, when they make a commitment, you know, con consider it done. And that's sort of what they have lived by. We're about to wrap up with one final clip about the Hoyts. But Dave, before we go, I also want to let our audience know that you yourself have, have quite the life story, which we'll actually be featuring on the next Real Sports on April 20th. So we'll certainly look forward to that. And I want to thank you, Dave, for, for coming on the podcast to talk about your dear friends, Dick and Rick Hoyt. Not a easy thing to do, but not a hard thing to do. You know, there's so much to talk about. But there's also a, a degree of sadness knowing Dick has passed. But I, I, I've also said, don't, don't be sad. They're gone. Be comforted knowing that they were in your life. Well, Dave, we're sorry for the loss of your friend and for all of those out there who are still mourning the loss of Dick Hoyt. And for those who want to see Dick and Rick in action, you can now watch one of their full Real Sports stories from 2010 by going to hbo.com backslash real sports. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. I want to thank you all for listening to this special edition of the podcast, which will now close out by going back to 2005. We ended that very first piece on the Hoyts with Dick explaining to Mary Carrillo that while he and Rick can't communicate like most other fathers and sons, words, well, they can be overrated. Rick can't make very many sounds, but he does this a lot when we're out there competing. It's not like a laugh. It's, it's like he's got a smile on his face and he's just making this noise, you know, this loud noise. Is that the prettiest sound in the whole world? <laughs> That's got to be some sound. Yeah, it really is because, you know, he's happy and he enjoys himself and he loves to be out there competing. And he's letting you know. And he's letting me know. <laughs> For a guy with so many problems, he sounds like a happy guy. He is a very happy guy. He probably lives a happier and better life than 95% of the population in this world. He loves life. He loves people. How do you raise a kid like that? Well, I guess just the way we did it. <laughs>